Law enforcement is under fire in my committee. We're fighting, and I'm glad to introduce the best law enforcement officer in America. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, everybody. First of all, I want to thank the veterans that are here tonight. Veterans, raise your hand. Thank you. And I say that because just a week ago, December 7th, I watched television, I watched, I listened to radio. Not one mention was made of Pearl Harbor Day That's right. on December 7th. That's pretty damn sad. So I want to talk about uh, law enforcement tonight. But first of all, I've been insulted three times as I, as I get up here to see. First of all, I'm told when I walk in the door, damn, you're not as tall as I thought you were. <laughs> well, no, I'm not Tom Selleck, okay? <laughs> then Fred, you said I only won by 51%. It was 51.7%. <laughs> now I'm last. I'm the last speaker. You guys have had just about enough tonight. But, uh, you know, as we're dealing with all this right now, it's been a hell, of a, a hell of a year, a hell of a summer. And when I think about the election, the way it was stolen, I think of everything that we are all dealing with this COVID. I think about law enforcement under attack and under siege. Folks, this is like a never ending episode of the Twilight Zone. Oh, yeah. 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 So right now, and I want to mention something about the governor. One thing thinking about it. Dan, you're absolutely right. Law enforcement, sheriffs, police chiefs across this state, law enforcement as a whole, has supported this governor for eight years. From his first election, from the day he came into my office, sat down with uh, Stuart Wilkins, and, and sold me a bill of goods, how much he was gonna do for law enforcement, how much he, he was good for the people. He had no idea about the heroin, the opioid problem that was just then coming to surface until he sat in my office. And here we are under attack today, and he's done nothing. He stood silent while law enforcement, chiefs, sheriffs, and the people that serve you the men and women that put their butts on the line every day, and they're not heroes every day, but they're committed to serve the public. Mm -hmm. He's done not a damn thing for. So just keep that in mind. Whatever he runs for in the future, he gets no support from me. Zero. Mm -hmm. So let me just, before I get into really what I want to say, a couple things. I've been asked this evening. Let me, let me just say this. Do you all hear me? I am not enforcing any of these silly COVID rules. Okay. I'm not the face cover police. I'm not the distancing police. I'm not the crowd control police. Okay, and I'm not peeking in your window on Thanksgiving or Christmas Day. Listen, I, unfortunately, I think in time, and Dan, you may agree, I think down in the future somewhere, maybe a short period of time, maybe a couple of years, we're going to find out that this was the, the, the biggest fraud ever perpetrated. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So when we, when we talk about law enforcement right now, this entire summer has been a summer of protest, attack on law enforcement, attack on policing, attack on the role that we play in maintaining civil order in this country, in this society. And we are under siege by the public, the liberals, those out there who want no enforcement of anything, by politicians who become elected, all of a sudden they are uh, subject matter experts, okay? They know nothing about policing or what we do or why we do it, but we're under attack. So I had the pleasure this summer, and I'm glad I did this. So listen, not only do I enforce the law, but as a sheriff, I have a constitutional obligation not only to enforce the law, to protect your liberties and your rights, just like we protected the rights of the people that we arrest. I got to protect the rights of the good guys too, and you are the good guys. And I took a couple days and went down to a seminar at Liberty University, the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association, and I'm glad I did. Not that I learned anything, okay? But it gave me a couple days down there among my peers, and there weren't a lot of people there, not a lot of sheriffs there. But it really allowed me to refocus on my role, what my role means to you, and what my obligations are. At the end of the day, I'm here serving you 
as a constitutional elected sheriff to preserve your rights and liberties. And at the core of what we do is enforcing the law, okay? The, the very core of what we do in police work is taking bad guys off the street. But you've got forces out there right now who don't want that. You've got the force, and I believe this is really good versus evil. Right, folks, listen, I, I'm not, I won't get into a lot of it, but, but I really, really believe that we are at a point in this society where we are good versus evil. We've got to somehow prevail. I'm not sure where that's going to go. I'm not sure where this is going to all end. But if you saw the protest this summer, and I don't know whether you all get to watch Facebook or whatever, when they came to my office, maybe, maybe several hundred, three hundred people came to my office, I said, I'll be damned if I'm going to let them come to my front door and call me out. I was out there waiting for them. Let me tell you, these, these people are absolutely, they're militants, they're extremists, they want no law and order, they want, they want nothing but uh, uh, total chaos out there. That's what they want, that's what they strive for. So since then, again, all across the country, all across uh, the state of Maryland locally, because of, listen, George Floyd, it's not about George Floyd. No. None of us, is, right? That was the fuse, that ignited everything they were looking to, to, to light up, okay? So now it's become everything against law enforcement, uh, you know, look what has happened. They're calling for defunding the police. Should be defund the police. Defend and fund the police. Right? Oh, yeah. Defend what we do. <laughs> you can make the issues. Uh, listen, people under, don't understand the very, our, our mission, our, our roles, or why we do what we do. Okay, we enforce the laws. Criminal laws, traffic laws. We maintain public order, okay? We investigate criminal acts against you. We've also become the catch-all for everything that happens in society. Not because we want to, we've inherited these roles. You talk about uh, the mental health problems on the street, we've inherited these roles. We respond to, to our overdoses now and save lives with Narcan, we've inherited this role. We never wanted to do that, but now we've inherited everything. So now when something starts to go a little bit south, it's all of our fault. You know, the public demands that we are 100% perfect 100% of the time. That's not reality. As much as we try, as hard as we train, and as committed as my men and women are, all the men and women are in law enforcement. It just doesn't go that way all the time. Uh, you know, one, one piece of this that nobody ever wants to talk about, you know, you talk about, you know, people of color, fault police for everything bad that happens. And if this were a crowd, people of color, I would say the same thing. I think some of you know I would. So everybody wants to fault law enforcement every time something happens, which ends in a bad outcome, and then somebody may get killed and then also involve you. So force to think about this, and I say this, you have to think about the criminality. You have to think about the, the segment of society, I don't care what race, what ethnicity you are, there's a segment of society that will always resist, always push back, okay, always challenge police, and when that happens on the street, nothing good ever comes of that, okay? What happened to the day when, and, and you look at every one of these incidents across the country, I don't care whether it's George Floyd, it's uh, a name on Freddie Gray in Baltimore, pick any incident, probably 99.99%, if that individual had a very simply, would have very simply obeyed a lawful That's order right. of that police officer, these things would never happen. That is the piece of this whole argument that nobody ever wants to mention, nobody ever wants to talk about. It's always the fault of law enforcement because something bad happened. You know, and if you very simply out there on the street, you are given an order, you might not like it, or given, you know, you, you stop, do this, you're under arrest, given an awful order, the recourse is not on the street. The recourse is not to fight, resist, push back. You can file a complaint, you can take it to court. There, there are a lot of ways there's a lot of recourse or avenues of recourse, okay, to get to get your, your day in court. But it's not fighting it out with police because nothing ever good comes to that. I'm really, really worried about where this is gonna go. And I say that because right now, over the past, I would say since August, September, one deputy every other week is walking into my office saying, Sheriff, I've had it. I'm done. Nothing against the agency, nothing against you. I've got my 20 years in. 
I've earned my pension. I'm healthy. I've got a young family. It's not worth it anymore. Bluetooth disconnected. No. Bluetooth connected. <laughs> not me. So what does that say that men and women who are committed, and I've got some very, very good men and women that are committed to this county. They're walking into my office. Bluetooth disconnected. Bluetooth connected. What do I do? Just keep talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but what does that say to young men and women who have dedicated their careers, they got to 20 years in or 25, whatever it might be, depending on when you were hired, and walk in the door and sheriff, I'm not done. And some of my best commanders, some of my best uh, senior deputies, people who had tons and tons of experience that you, you don't get overnight, are leaving the, leaving the field, leaving the career. And no new young men and women are coming into this. I'll give you an analysis here. So I'd say five or six, seven years ago, we would be lucky to have three or four vacancies and we'd get five, 600 applicants. Now, right now, I'm sitting on 21 vacancies. My authorized strength is down 21 deputies, and I'll be lucky in this next hiring process if I get 70 applicants. Now, a little bit of the math here. So if I start out, let's say I start out with 100 applicants. By the time we do the testing, written testing, physical agility, the oral interviews, we're, we've cut it down by one half. So I'm at 50%, I'm at 35, or I'm at 50. So out of 100, I'm at 50. So then we rank, we list, we create a list of eligibility, and we rank them. So then we, we uh, offer uh, conditional offers of, of hire for positions. So then we start doing the backgrounds. So out of that 100, after we wash everybody through the backgrounds, and I'm not going to lower my standards, okay? I won't do that. I'm looking to get four oh, wow. on average. I'm like, that's, that's a good process. If I can get four people, men or women, who can cut the mustard, make the grade, and I would, again, won't lower my standards, I don't care who you are, I'll be looking to get four. So think about this. To get those four on the street is roughly about 18 months. The hiring process is four to five months. The police academy is almost eight months now. Then we have the field training. So by the time I get an officer on the street, it's 18 months from the date that this guy gave me his retirement letter. So that's where we're ahead of this. I'm really, really concerned with all the criticism toward law enforcement. You're not going to get anybody once you get into the field. Why would you do it? Okay, why? When you're not appreciated, you're, you're, you're attacked, you're, you're, you're uh, called everything under the sun. To go out there and do something you're committed to doing, I don't blame them. I wouldn't do it either. I've got, I've, I've been privileged to serve as sheriff for four terms in this county. I'm not sure I can get elected in this county anymore. It's changed so much. Fred talked about it. Last time, 51.7%. My first couple elections, I was getting 68, 69% of the vote. Okay? That's how much it's changed. But more importantly is what the, 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 the this county is going so far the other way, it's unbelievable. Yeah. The worst thing ever happened, every, every day of my life is a 12 round fight, okay? Every decision I make is a fight. I gotta fight Jan Gardner, the county executive. I gotta fight the county council, okay? I've gotta fight uh, Senator Ron Young and his wife. Half the delegation. Every single day, listen, I'll never give up, I'll never bend, but every day is a, is a 12 round fight. I'm just concerned where law enforcement's going in this country, in this county. Uh, you look at some states now, they're cutting their, depleting their agencies by, by large numbers. Officers are retiring everywhere. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know where it's all gonna go. I'm really, really concerned. And I tell people this, and I mean this with all sincerity, and I'll take a couple questions. I tell people every single day, be prepared to protect yourself, your family, and your home because we can't do it. We simply aren't going to be there to do it. So, uh, let me take a couple questions that can be on any topic. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Rosa Sullivan. Hey, I'm a, I'm a sold out uh, Christian conservative and I love the church. And I'll say this, you know, the greatest event in all of human history is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
But I've been upset even before this COVID thing that the church won't stand up. Right. We need right. a grassroots movement. We need pastors. We need to rally behind pastors and say, you gotta stand up. Yeah. You gotta stand up for the unborn. You gotta stand up for traditional marriage. You gotta stand up for righteousness. Because 2 Chronicles seven fourteen it says, if my people will humble and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll heal their land. And, you know, you said there's a, a, a group of people, all this area, we, it's on tap. We're not, we're not tapping it. If we could get a hold of churches and we could get, you know, I'm sure they're afraid of losing attendance. And maybe they're afraid of losing their tax exempt status and all this other stuff. But if we could get, you know, churches to me, they're just nothing but a bunch of sugar-coated peeps. Peep disconnected. And, you know, they're sugar-coated <laughs> peeps. They have no backbone. They won't take a stand for righteousness. You know, well, God, but, but God just what you know, said, that churches are being held hostage. Right. Yes. Churches are truly being held hostage, just like businesses, restaurants, mm -hmm. bars, things like that. They right now are, are being crippled and held hostage by this governor, by this county executive. And, and now I'm just talking generally locally here, but, but you make a point. Thank you. Yes. Um, when are you going to announce for governor? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, I'll be, I'll be lucky. Listen, it's, it's going to be lucky if any Republican can win in this county in the county race anymore. You look at the numbers, like Dan said, do the math. It's, it's really going to be tough. Yes, sir. I always like to leave on a positive note. So uh, I'm actually writing an article right now for the Journal of Civil Defense about the positives that have come out of this event. Uh, because Americans have finally woken up and realized that the toilet paper's not always going to be there, the baby formula's not always going to be there, the water's not always, and they're actually starting to plan. And so I'm a volunteer vice president with the American Civil Defense Association. We've been around since 1962. And all, all we do is uh, we educate Americans about how to prepare for disaster, how not to have a disaster. And so what I would like to tell everyone, there's a police movie that will be coming out next year. It's called Hounds from Hell. It's done by Jim Lilly, who is a uh, police officer over in Howard County. Uh, it's, it, there'll be three parts to this movie, and the first one is Hounds in Hell, and it's a very positive portrayal of, in fiction, of his experience with Howard County Police. And so that will be nationwide. It's going to be very good for police because culture, as we know, precedes politics. And so there are a lot of people out there right now working to change the culture so that you don't have to face what you're facing. Let, let me talk about guns. This is something that really, really bothers me. Um, you know, I'm already, we're already hearing the Biden administration saying that we are going to uh, do a buyback of AR-type rifles. I think that's the only thing they said so far was, was the buyback of the AR rifles. Or going to tax the hell out of you a couple hundred bucks a year per, per rifle, plus tax magazines. And this is really concerning to me about how they're going to go about doing this. Okay. Uh, Dan, you made a com I'm going to comment to something you said a while ago. The Maryland State Police, and I talk to the state police on a routine basis, they don't want to go down the road with this COVID enforcement stuff. I can tell you that. They don't want to do that, but they are the governor's personal police. And I'm really concerned about where this is going to go uh, if they attempt to take your firearms. I'm, I'm, I'm a gun enthusiast. I don't just talk. I live it. I'm a shooter. All that stuff. So I, I do it every day. It's part of my life. But I'm really, really concerned about how the federal government may think that they're going to go back one door to door or come into your home if they can determine that you own a, a prohibited regulated firearm. What's that going to lead to where that's going to go? Because I will do everything I can to, to stop it. I don't know what that's going to be. I don't know what that looks like. But my men and women are going to be at risk. I don't think anybody wants this, but, but listen, this is what they said they're going to do. So expect it. How we deal with it, I have no idea. I have no clue. Is it going to come to, to state and local police? Won't be my office. Is it come, going to come to a federal police force? I'm already hearing rumors of uh, uh, abolishing ICE, right, which who we work with closely in Frederick County and our very successful program of deporting, uh, deporting criminals, okay? It's working wonderfully. They're going to work with that program. They're going to abolish ICE. Are they going to turn that agency into, into gun grabbers? I don't know. I have no 
do. So all these things are in the back of my mind, are part of that 12 round fight every day. I'm just really, really concerned about we are where we are as a country, as a society, and, and hopefully guys like Dan in the legislature. I wish we had some good Republican congressmen that represented Maryland. We don't. We got one, right, Dan? One congressman, Andy Harris. So I, I'm really concerned. The sad part, I'm gonna end up with this. I, I'm in a position where, uh, as a sheriff, I've got key people in my administration that I have to trust. And I trust them with my life because they're there for me every day. What's happened to President Trump is unfortunately, he can trust nobody. That's right, Marty. That's right. I mean, the people on his inner circle, if you can't trust your inner circle, the people you appoint to carry out your mission, your vision, your directives, you're in trouble, and I think we've seen that as a president. The, the only thing I can say with certainty out of all this, that I will never, ever, ever get an invite to the West Wing anymore. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> so, Fred, thanks for having me. Thank you all. Hey, listen, I'm there every day. Here we need to I need you to get a hold of, and I'm willing to come and speak to any group or answer any questions. Thank you.